We'd like to thank you for joining us for another episode of Looking to Jesus. My name is John Hines. I preach for the Church of Christ in Northridgeville, Ohio. My co-host is... Daniel Sanders, preacher for the Norwalk Church of Christ, Norwalk, Ohio. Daniel, how are you doing today? Uh, doing all right. In, endured all the cold weather last yep. week, and now we're going to enjoy 40-degree weather this week. Yes, we are, and we are looking forward to that we're going to have a couple days of rain and i'm sitting here with eight inches of snow so it's going to be a soupy mess around us but that's that is quite all right uh last week we began with part one talking about the lord's prayer and just sort of had a little so oh, sort of the the first few verses before we got into the actual prayer itself but this week we're going to do that we're going to get into the prayer itself so we're looking in matthew chapter six and of course, the Lord contrasts. You know, He doesn't want us to pray like the like the heathen with their vain repetitions, and He doesn't want us to pray like the hypocrites standing um, standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the streets. Um, but we're going to pray in this manner. Verse nine: Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14, he says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay. I thought we might just pull it apart, kind of verse by verse, item by item. And so... You know, I think in your notes, then you kind of have one of the points, is this a rote prayer? And by rote, I don't mean W-R-O-T-E, but is this just like, you know, sometimes parents will teach their kids. It's like, okay, this is this is the prayer. And sometimes those kids turn into adults that think this is the prayer. Yeah, yeah. I think some people will take it as that way. But yeah, you know, Jesus has given us an example. Here's some things. Here's some thoughts of how we're to conduct ourselves, how we go to God in prayer, being able to go to him. Can you say this prayer is a question that some people may ask. I don't see why not. But we start getting into you know what we talked about last week in verse 7. Don't use this vain repetition. Some people just say it because, well, we just need to say something. Right. And that makes it vain. Uh, you know, so I, I don't have an issue where sometimes where people want to say this, maybe that's all that they can think of at the moment of being able to pray. Okay, Jesus gave us an opportunity and a model to be able to pray and pray in this manner. Can we say something? Maybe we might miss out on some of the things uh, that are said here if we worded this prayer. But Jesus gives us an example of things to be able to consider when we pray to God. Yeah, and your your point about he's he's giving us ideas we can pray about almost topics we can pray for yeah. it's not meant to be an exhaustive list either right um like we were talking last week when the tax collector said be merciful to me a sinner god yeah which i would see you know we do pray for forgiveness but I, I was thinking of other passages just for example is it timothy or titus where he says pray for those who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life well, that's, I mean, I suppose you could find it there in your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but you'd have to think about it more deeply to, to understand that. Right. Um, it, it's obviously not meant to be a, um, it's not meant to be a, you will pray using these words for one thing, because Jesus prayed not using these words. Yeah. He prayed in the garden, you know, let this cup pass from me, uh, you know. He, and he prays that three times. He he doesn't go through this this whole prayer. I, I think even there. So he's he's given us ideas. He's yeah. giving us topics. And I think now it, it is. Hmm. How can I put it? There's more there than meets the eye. Let, let me put it like that. Yeah. If you just look at it on the surface, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, you know, whatever. But you start peeling back the layers, and it's like, oh, there's actually a good bit there, and it it if we'll think about it and chew on it. So let's, let's, let's think about it piece by piece. Okay. 
All right, so we'll start with verse 9, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Um, what points do you want to you want us to, to draw out of that? Do well, you have anything in yours? It's to hold God high in reverence. You know, we're addressing him as our Father. Right. Hallowed, hallowed be your name. You know, we're not just coming uh, just, you know, just there, there's... I want to say there's there's a little bit of there's there's the awe, respect, fear that Bef- we talk. Yeah, before we ever talk about us. Yeah, we're talking about him. Yeah, we come to him, we address him in our prayer, for, and I think normally, almost all the time, people will do that in some sort of way when they're praying. Uh, that I've seen over over my lifetime of some sort. Some people will you know say, uh, "Dear God in heaven," or. Uh, Holy Father in heaven, or yeah. being able to give him some sort of reverence in some sort of way, uh, and that that's important because we're addressing who we're talking to in our prayers and, and addressing him as the sustainer and helper of all things. And there's an element of worship there. It's like yeah. hallowed be thy name. There's a recognition of his holiness. You know, I I kind of think of how how children can be sometimes, or you know how how we can be. You know, if if we come up and like, Daniel, can I ask you a favor? <laughs> and it's like, oh boy, what is this? You know, and and all I'm interested in is I I need something from you. Yeah. And it's like we need something from the Lord. We do. But before we talk about our needs, we should recognize His worthiness. Yeah. It's like our Father in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Holy, holy, holy. It's like He is holy. He's worthy of worship. It's like bef- we, we before address, we talk, we address our thanks at what He's done for us. Yeah. When we think about some of this, you know, yeah. it may not. We may be able to go into some detail with our own personal prayers, but then there's times where, Lord, Lord God, thank you for all that you've done for us, you know, or for me, or whatever it may be. Yeah. Or just a recognition of of His holiness. Yeah. And it's you know that that recognition. I th- I thought it was interesting. I looked up. This aspect of our father, that's actually a little, it's a little different. And I looked up how often God is referenced, uh, how often God is referred to as father in the Old Testament. And he's only referred to father 15 times. Um, Pretty often where it starts happening a little more often is in David's lifetime, whether talking, whether David is speaking or the Lord is speaking about Solomon. I will be a father to him. But overall, and I think the first mention of God as a father is not until Deuteronomy. And it's only once in Deuteronomy. Then it starts showing up, like I said, a little more in David's lifetime. But altogether in the Old Testament, 15 times. You come up to the New Testament, and he's referred to father 241 times. And I think that's interesting. And I think as an application, we see when Jesus says, praying this way our father and that it calls us into a relationship with god and that in the old testament he's usually referred to as things like god almighty you know things along those yeah. lines and, and sort of above mankind yeah well when jesus comes emmanuel god with us the word that was with god the word that was god and now the word dwells among men and all of a sudden we're brought into a closer relationship and there's an intimacy there and it's like, oh, our father. And all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute. You mean we don't have, you know, and it doesn't mean we don't have to have reverence for him. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean that he's not almighty God. But it's like, oh, he's not like those Greek gods who are up on Mount Olympus throwing lightning bolts down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's not he's not that God. Yeah. It's like, oh, he's actually our father. Yeah. And we should act like his children. And, and our, our father, he, he, there's a time to say, my God. Yeah. For example, when Jesus is on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he says, our father here. And that calls us into fellowship. And he's like, he's not just, he's not just my father. He's our father. Yeah. And so you, you have, you have that idea and it's just a, you know, to think about that idea of, of our Father in heaven and that he is our Father and hallowed be his name. And he is, he is holy. Anything else you wanted to add before we move on to the next section? No, 
I think we kind of hit that on the head there first. All right. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now Johnny's going to rant. All right. (laughs) Because our whole lives, what have we heard about that verse? And we have in no way spoken about this beforehand. <laughs> We've, I've, I've heard, I'll just say what I've heard my whole life. Obviously, that's talking about the church. And this is where Johnny steps. <laughs> we, we need to think about how the Lord spoke about the kingdom. Um, and you have to look at the context because sometimes he's referring to Sometimes, sometimes he's referring, just for example, I'm going to look at a few passages. So let's look here in, for example, the Beatitudes. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Is that talking exclusively about the church? Uh, no. I don't, I don't think so. The church, and we recognize when Jesus says, I will build my church, when he's talking to Peter much later on. Right? So we recognize the church has not been built yet because the foundation, the cornerstone hasn't been laid yet. Right. We recognize that. But we we ought to we need to recognize how scripture and how the Lord thinks about the kingdom. So just for example, at the end of the Lord's Prayer in verse thirteen, do not lead us into temptation, deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom. It's like, is that talking about the church? If the church doesn't exist yet, it's speaking in the present tense. Yours is the kingdom. And so you just have to look look at the context. Some of the other passages, look over in chapter 8. Okay. In chapter 8, at verse 11, and this is when the Lord heals a centurion's servant, and he says, And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, Um, come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. He's not talking, he's speaking about the kingdom, but for the sons of the kingdom to be cast out, who are the sons of the kingdom there? It's like he's talking about the, the unbelieving Jews. Yeah. Well, how are they sons of the kingdom? The church hasn't even been established yet. It's like you gotta look at how the context is speaking of the kingdom. Um, over in chapter 21, let's see, in my notes I put chapter 21, verse 43. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God, talking to the Jews, those who are rejecting, verse 42, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. That's not talking about the church per se. It's talking about the overall kingdom. Again, I understand the church The church has not been built in that sense. But to look at how the Lord is speaking about the kingdom, when we come back to Matthew 6, to just make this point, Matthew 6 is three years before Jesus goes to the cross. Did any of the disciples understand the nature of the church yet? <laughs> so no, I mean there was there's some some foreknowledge, but I when yeah. not, not the the full scope of everything. But how, it's still coming into play because you know you mentioned you know you get further on down Matthew six, uh, chapter right. sixteen right. verse eighteen nineteen speaks Peter. Oh, I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, right. Peter. I'm going to build yeah, yeah. my church. I'm going to give you the keys right. to be able to open up. So no, they don't. Right. There's not full comprehension of everything. But how long have they been learning about the kingdom of God? Well, they've been learning about that for a long time. Yeah. And when we think about the kingdom, you have a king, you have citizens who are subject, you have protection, you have all those things. Now the church and the church age is, we recognize that's coming. But what the Lord is teaching them about how to pray, it had to mean something to them. It had to mean something to them. Yeah. And if if they don't understand the church, then, then it's, it's like, what are we talking about? But they understood the kingdom. And I always tie together 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's what we're talking about. That's the point. The point is not in in what I, I guess I should have led with this probably. When people say you cannot pray this anymore because the church has come and therefore you cannot say your kingdom come, your will be done because the church has come. I, I don't agree with that myself. And it's like we want the kingdom to spread. The Lord has always wanted his kingdom to spread. Even before, let me look up a passage, Daniel. Hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> Remember where he's talking about pressing into the kingdom. Let's see if my brain's working today. But I think when you look at this, it's important for us to be able to take note of including you know, your will be done. Yeah. That God's will still needs to be done today. We, that we can, we, you know, seeing that inclusion of this, of being able to say, okay, your will be done, or your kingdom come, God, okay. Some would say, well, you know, the, we're, the, the kingdom came, okay, but your will be done. There's still part to be, to be part of God's kingdom. There's still work that we have to do. You can look further on into the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew seven twenty one. If you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, what must you do? You must do the Father's will. So we see there's that combination of everything needing to take place, needing to be effective for us in being able to be part of his kingdom. And again, you know, the Jews kind of knew a little bit about a kingdom because they were God's people yeah. already. And so there was an understanding of the kingdom. Uh, maybe their interpretation of the kingdom was still not fully understood. Yeah. I mean, it, it's being, it's being revealed. Yeah. The cornerstone's about to be laid. Right. But God is ruling on his throne yeah, and always has been ruling on his throne. As long as there is, I think as long as there is authority, there is a kingdom. Yeah. Now the nature of that kingdom may change, if you even want to say that, when you get to the church. Um, but regardless, th- this is Matthew chapter 11 at verse... Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, it's Luke 16 and verse 16 where it talks about the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. So, all the, and I guess my point is just when people say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We, we could talk about when the Lord returns. And I think there are passages that speak about the kingdom that way. Yeah. And we could talk about the church, the kingdom growing. And the church is referred to as the kingdom. But the overall kingdom is God's people. And it always has been God's people. And so when he says, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you, he's talking to Jews who were God's people, but by their own disobedience, they were rejecting the Messiah. And he's like, you're not going to be God's people anymore because you're not submitting to the king. You're not submitting to the Lord, the Lord of lords and the king of kings. Therefore, you're going to be chucked out. But there are going to be those coming from the north, south, east, and west, the Gentiles, and they're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. I love asking the question in Bible class, are are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a part of the church? I just love asking that. And I love asking it that way. Are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a part of the church? Because I... A lot of people will be like, well, no, they're not a part of the Yes, they are a part of the church. It's like, hello, the church is the called out. Yeah. Was Abraham called out? He was kind of the first one called out. It's like, yes, good night alive. They're a part of the kingdom. Anyway, I told you I was going to rant. <laughs> Pardon me. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. And, and my overall point, and, and just on a simple level, is it had to mean something to them in Matthew 6. Yeah. It had to be something they, they could pray for. And it was something that they understood. It, it, it wasn't something that they should have been left with scratching their heads saying, well, wait a minute, what is the kingdom? It's like the kingdom is God's will being done. That's what it is. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Anything you want to rant about before we move on? <laughs> no, you kind of got everything. Uh, I'm sorry. You know, the only thing I can the only thing I can add is you know what you said, Mark one fifteen. Repent. There's that there's that desire to yeah. do God's will, that change of doing God's will. Repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah. Here it is. It's all laid out. You got to make change in your life. And I I will say, you know, the kingdom has come nigh. And the whole point is the Messiah is coming. Yeah. And it's like, what manner of persons ought we to be? Whether it was when he came the first time or when he's coming back, we can make the same arguments. It's like, what manner of persons ought you to be? The king is coming. (laughs) It's like, you better be ready. Otherwise, he's going to use his authority and say, depart from me. Yeah. And that's that's the point. Submit to the king. Right? And that it's like submit to the king. Do yeah. do his will. That's the point. And Jesus did the Father's will as as well. Anyway, okay. We're ready to move on. Sure. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. You want to tackle this one? <laughs> sure. Well, I, I you think about, you know, give us this day. We're asking God to help us now. You know, right. Give us this day. Here it is. We're, we're asking for help. We're needing some sustenance, uh, the provider of all things. And, you know, the idea of giving us this day our daily bread, again, you need food to survive. Uh, I'm looking at it in, in some different ways. Provide, God, please help provide for us these different things. And for us, when we look at this, taking, you know, looking at the bread of life, Jesus is the bread of life. He talks about that over in John chapter 6. And you look at verse 33, I got a few different verses, but John chapter six, verse 33, where it says here for the bread of God is he who comes down from the heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. John chapter six, verse 48, Jesus again, just reiterating, I am the bread of life. Verse 51 uh, says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will for- live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh and which I shall give for the life of the world. Now, looking at that, there were some people that rejected this very, the, the people that reject this comment, but because of what Jesus said, you know, my, my flesh is, is, is the bread. Right. They were taking it in a literal sense. We're looking at this. God is providing us the things that we need to sustain our life. We can ask God Help us continue to sustain our life, to do God's will. Going back to what we just talked about there in the previous verse, your will be done. How can we do God's will? Well, God's now providing us a way to doing his will, providing the things that we need to take care of our spiritual body. We could even look at it as our physical body, but more importantly, we're looking at this this spiritual body, give us our daily bread. Let us take advantage of it. Let us take opportunity to it. Jesus has given his word as that food for us. Let us take into account those things that he has said. And I don't think it's wrong to look at, to, to ask the question, is he speaking about our physical bread, our literal bread or spiritual bread? I think you could look at it either way. Yeah. And, you know, Jesus, in when he was tempted, and he tells the devil, man shall not live by bread alone. That bread there, he's talking about physical bread. He'd right. been fasting for 40 right. days. Exactly. And he was hungry. Yeah. James chapter 2, when it talks about if a brother or sister is naked and destitute, and they, and they come to you, and you don't give them the things needed for the body. It's like, we have physical needs. Yes. So it's not wrong to say, give us this day our daily bread thinking about physical needs we're right. thankful for our physical needs absolutely and it's not give us this day our daily cake yeah there's a simplicity here it's like give us our daily bread godliness with contentment is great gain and, and just take care of us physically but also spiritually and all your verses obviously come into play and it's like yeah he is <laughs> man shall man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Yeah. And so we think about consuming God's word daily. Um, you know, the sad thing, it, it, it calls to my mind the manna in the Old Testament. Yeah. And they would come out, and Jesus refers to that in John 6, one yes, of the passages does. that you refer to. 
and they got to the point where they actually hated the manna. You know, the I think the verse says, our soul loathes this worthless bread. And it's like, you ungrateful wretches. Yeah. <laughs> and people, people treat God's word the same way. They treat it as wearisome and burdensome. Yeah. Oh, how can you sit there and talk to us about these different things in these modern yeah. times or whatever it may be? Oh, we just want to just be just more modern and more worldly like everybody else. Can we just do yeah. that? We're getting away from God's word. And they do that Monday through Saturday. And then they say, give us this day our weekly bread yeah. on Sunday. Yeah. And that's what a lot of folks are interested in. Just a little bit of weekly bread. Yeah. Daily bread. Not so much. Now, when it comes to physical things, we got to have three squares a day. Yeah. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Spiritually speaking, we'll save that for Sundays between 1030 and noon. Yeah. Tops. It's like, no, you got to come back to the Lord's Prayer. It's like, give us this day our daily bread. These are the things we need, body and soul. Yeah. Right? Anything else before we look at the next section? No. All right. Forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. Uh, So that obviously means if I want forgiven, that means all I have to do is forgive others, right? And then I'll be forgiven. And that, I'm golden, right? (laughs) Sweet. As long as I forgive others, it doesn't matter what I do. Awesome. (laughs) It's like, no, that's not what it means. Yeah, (laughs) That's not what it means. But we do have to be. It's part. We are called to be merciful. (laughs) Yes. And if we are not merciful... God will not have mercy on us. Matthew 18, 21, 22. There's the question. Lord, how many times do I forgive? Seven yeah. times. She says 70 times. Seven. Then goes on and teaches the parable about the unforgiving servant, which we talked about yep. in recent weeks uh, about that. And being able to be ready to forgive. We are receiving forgiveness. God is willing to forgive us. And, you know, I know that we read verse 14 and 15 you know, yep. Bring them back. Bring them back into play right now. There in Matthew yeah, yeah. on that passage there in Matthew twelve six twelve. If we forgive men their trespasses, God's going to forgive us. If we don't forgive, then we see that we don't have forgiveness from God. Yep. We see that's part of it. That's part of it of us to be able to receive forgiveness. Now we also talk about the other side of it, where we have the humility, the need for help. Give us this day. Again, we're starting to include all these different principles in this prayer. Your will be done, God. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us as we need for as we forgive others. So again, we need forgiveness. How do we do that? Well, we search God's word, we repent, we turn away from our sins, and we ask God to forgive us. We use the power of prayer. We could use passages right. in James chapter five about the power or the, the prayer of faith will be able to help forgive one another, being able to help save one another, being able to help along the way of being able to to restore one another as we look at all these different things. Yep. God has given us this ability to be able to use prayer, not only just to be able to address these petitions that we may have of needing assistance, but even the thought of forgiveness. And that's critical in understanding this in our life and service to God. When we move from physical needs to spiritual needs, and we better recognize what, what, what eternally matters, let's put it like that. And it's, it's the forgiveness of our sins, the remission of sins. It's like Jesus did not go to the cross. Maybe I should be careful when I say this. Sometimes I get in trouble. <laughs> Jesus did not go to the cross to give me my daily bread. You say that's fair to say? When I, and when I say that, I mean my physical daily bread. Um, he went to the cross for the remission of my sins. Yeah, It's like this is... This is the problem. And that's what Romans 5, 6 through 11 pinpoints about us being reconciled to God. Right. That Christ right. died for the ungodly. Right. Not the, phys- not the physically hungry. Right. Yes. Did he provide those things? Does he know that we need those things? Yes. Is there still that providing of those things? Yes. Yep. But the purpose, the, the, the center point of it all is Christ dying for the ungodly. Yep. Yep, very I much. get what you were saying there on that one. Yeah, yeah, just just the idea, and I, I'm not saying the Lord is not the giver of our daily bread because give us this day our daily bread shows our dependence on Him, right, for all things. But as far as His going to the cross, and we recognize the work He was trying to do, yeah, that He is He is seeking the sheep who are lost, and and that's it's like we need the forgiveness of our sins. 
And as we're forgiven, it's like we need to forgive others. We, yeah. we need to be merciful. We're called to be merciful. And um, that can be hard to do. It's a lot easier to be like the, the parable you mentioned, the, um, the unforgiving servant. Yeah. To be forgiven and then go out and abuse others. That's right. much easier. It's much easier to do those things. But we have God our Father who is wanting us yeah. to come to him to pray. And you know, there is that sense of you know, the, the burden gets a little eased uh, maybe when we talk about this idea of forgiveness and being able to ask God, help us forgive others. Yeah. You know. Yeah, very much so. Uh, verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, even I've heard people ask about that because of James chapter one, where, you know, God is not tempted. Yeah. And that God does not, God is not tempted and God does not tempt us with evil. God does not tempt us that way. So why do you have this idea? And I think it's it's like we're asking for the Lord's guidance. Yeah. And I think it all goes back to thy will be done. And, but as we go through life, we will face temptation. You know, scripture talks about we are tempted as is common to man. And it's like, it happens. Doesn't mean we're looking for it. It, you know, we, we pray, do not lead us into, into temptation. But, and I mean, this is, I'm thinking of first John one and two. These things I write to you that, so that ye may not sin, but if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Yeah. It's like he doesn't want us to sin, but if we do, we have an advocate. Right. Do not lead us into temptation. Okay. We don't want to, we don't want to be there, but deliver us from the evil one. If we are there, deliver us. Yeah. So kind of the, the same concept a, a little bit. And um, we need deliverance. The Lord, he does not allow us to be tempted but beyond what we're able to stand with temptation he makes the way of escape but he doesn't make us go through that door <laughs> yeah like, well, that's right you know i think about psalm 23 4 yea though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear fear no evil for your staff and your right. rod they come for me there's that guiding factor with everything that we want god to help us and guide us and i think you're spot on with you know that that thought of being able to help us through temptation we are going to face temptation yeah but lord help us get out of it yeah. uh, you know god does not want us to perish but wants us to come to repentance you know, yeah. if you think about that either persevere or, or yeah you know sometimes yeah. you got to persevere in the in the situation exactly and, and going back to you know not trying to sound uh cliche or whatever that may not be the right word but hebrews 12 1 and 2 the title of our podcast yeah. look to jesus right how are we going to be able to not be not go into temptation and give in to temptation look to jesus right there's think, that there's that preventative factor with that that we can be able to use sometimes we're going to be facing temptation and then we got we got to look to jesus still regardless maybe yeah. we can be able to avoid it but if we're in that the middle of that temptation we can be able to get out of it too uh yeah, and he, he equips us to do that. Yeah. And that's the whole point of that Hebrews 12 passage. That's the whole point of Hebrews 11. That's the point of the whole Bible, I suppose. <laughs> that, you know, going all the way back to the beginning. Yeah. You know, when God is talking to Cain. It's like sin lies at the door, but right. you should rule over it. Don't let it have dominion over you. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, so here, deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It's like, who gets the credit? It's, it's like, God. It's God. Well, and we have to give God the credit with everything, with our prayers, yeah. with everything that we're going through in this life. I mean, his is the kingdom. It's his power, and he gets the glory. You know, here Paul is, and, you know, when, when we get to heaven, I know there's going to be a long line of people wanting to talk to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> I'm glad we're going to be there for eternity because I yeah. want to get a chance to... You're like, gonna get your, you'll get your turn eventually. And I mean, to, to be with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob yeah. and Peter and James and John and Paul and to be with all those individuals. And here Paul is, and when he's writing to the Corinthians, he said, listen, I sowed, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. What are we? We ain't nothing. Yeah. It's like, no, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And as much as we may admire other other men... You know, and I don't think it's wrong to admire them and the work they did. Yeah, we recognize 
they didn't die for our sins. Right. They didn't send their son to the earth to die for our sins. Exactly. It's God. It's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And theirs is the power, kingdom, and the glory forever. And so you already brought in those last couple verses. And I think there's a reason, you know, those verses are kind of after the prayer. It's like, it's like this is serious. Yeah. You better... You better be forgiving. It, it yeah, it, it it's just a a, a callback to it to, yeah. to 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 think on this again. And it's like, what are they really going to have trouble with? <laughs> Asking for their daily bread? No, we're good with that. You know, recognizing God's holiness, we're good with that too. Oh, you mean we actually have to forgive others? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think your your phrase, it's a callback. Yeah, and it's like, wow, that sounds like a repeated lesson there. It's like, why are you repeating yourself, Jesus? Because it needs it's repeated. Nece- yeah, exactly. It's necessary. It, it's necessary. It's for emphasis' do. sake. Yes. So, uh, that's everything I had, Daniel. You got anything else? No, I think we got everything. All right. Appreciate. Yep. Yeah, appreciate it. Thought it was a thought. It was a good study. I hope it was beneficial for you if you're listening along with us. I know last week we did this on video. If you happen to see that, this week just audio. We got together. The weather cooperated. Yep, the weather cooperated. Um, but we will be doing video in the future. Um, mentioned last week, Daniel's going to be moving here in weeks or a few months uh, at some we'll point. Be, we'll be there middle of March at the at the latest we'll, yep. when we'll be relocated. I think that's the plan so far. But good to see you, Daniel. Glad good to see you, too. Glad to be with you. So appreciate everyone tuning in. Appreciate you as we, we strive to walk that straight and narrow path looking to Jesus. Hope you tune in next week as well. Thank you.